Greetings friends, this is Steve Dupuy with the Continuing Church of God. Today I want to talk about one of the least favorite topics in the Christian world and one of the most favorite topics. The least favorite topic is persecution. We will focus on the persecution that is perpetrated on Christians shortly before Jesus returns. The most favorite topic we'll talk about is the love of God. And we'll focus on why he allows persecution to be perpetrated on Christians. So the topic for today's discussion is end time persecutions and the love of God. If persecution is one of the least favorite topics in the Christian world, why talk about it? Because Christians have been persecuted ever since the crucifixion of Jesus and will continue to be persecuted right up until his return at the resurrection. Actually, those that have been created in the image and likeness of God have been attacked and persecuted since the time of Adam. But the time is drawing near to the final countdown before the return of Jesus and persecutions against the members of the Bride of Christ, which is you and I will constantly grow more intense as we enter the end time persecution. And yes, I know we are told in Matthew 24, 36 that no one knows the day or the hour of his return. However, as we are also told in the parable of the fig tree in Matthew 24, 32, that we will know that summer is near, which means that we will know when the time of Jesus' return is getting close. And that time is now getting close. Now let's confirm the, fr the fact that there will be a special effort to persecute Christians by reading John 15 verses 18 through 21. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Since they most certainly persecuted Jesus, therefore they will most certainly persecute us. But why? Why would God allow us to be hated and persecuted if we are servants of His Son? Let's turn to Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 11 for the answer. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, aside, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run the race with endurance that has set, been set before us. We are to run the race with endurance. But still, why? Continuing in verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We run the race which includes persecution, written here as enduring the cross, in order to complete uh, our faith because of the joy of receiving our inheritance in the first resurrection. Now verse 3. For consider him who endured the, such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. We are encouraged not to become weary resisting the attacks of Satan. And since we have not yet resisted to bloodshed, it is hinted that our endurance may include shedding our own blood. A key point is now revealed in verses 5, 6, and 7. Verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, 
and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? We now understand that the persecution or chastening we now receive and will receive in the future, we receive because God himself loves us. We have to endure and not grow weary. In verses 8 through 10, we realize that another key point is why we are persecuted now is so that we will actually become children of God and that we may actually be partakers of His holiness. Verse 8. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who cor corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened as us as seemed best to them. But he, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Let's remember that we are being chastened for our profit. Now verse 11. We get to the crux of the matter. Our persecution will not be joyful, but painful. But the pain will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And here's verse 11. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So in Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 11, we have a complete explanation of why God allows persecutions to come to those he has called and chosen. God allows persecutions to come to us because he loves us. Realizing that God ch chastises those he loves, a thought occurred to me. If there really was a biblical rapture that raptured people to protect them from any chastisement that would occur seven years prior to the return of Jesus Christ, that would mean that any of those so raptured were illegitimate and not really children of God. Fortunately, there is no such thing as a biblical rapture. Now that we know why God persecutes us, we no, need to know exactly who it is that will be persecuted. Jesus already told us that if they persecuted him, they will persecute us. But just who is us? Let's read Matthew 16, verses 13 through 19. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, meaning Jesus Christ, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So the us that is being persecuted along with Jesus is his church. And who is his church? We can find the start of the church that is being persecuted and built upon the rock in Acts, chapter 2 which we can read for ourselves if we are not already familiar with it, uh, the account of the Holy Spirit falling on the Twelve Apostles. When Jesus said, uh, when Jesus told Peter that the gates of the grave would not prevail against the church he started in Acts, he also gave us the chronological history of the existence of that church, starting in Acts, and continuing right up, uh, up through the time of his second coming. That history and proof of the, that the gates of Hades will not prevail against his uh, church is found in the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation. Let's pick up that history starting with the fourth era of the church, which is the Thyatira era, and work our way forward through the time of the churches of Laodicea. 
We'll start in Revelations 2, verses 24 and 26. 24 through 26. Verse 24. Now to you, I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the uh, depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Notice verse 25. Jesus says to hold fast till he comes. This is telling us that there will be some Thyatira Christians who will still be holding services when Jesus returns. Now let's look at the next era, the Sardis era of the church, starting in Revelation 3, verse 1. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Here, Jesus is telling the Sardis Christians that he will come upon them as a thief, and they will not know what hour that will happen. Once again, Jesus is telling us that the Sardis portion of the church will be holding services when he returns. An interesting side note on verse 3 is that Jesus tells the Sardis congregation that if they don't repent and watch, they will not know the hour of Jesus' coming. Is it possible that the day and hour of his coming will be known at some point in the future? Now we'll continue uh, to move forward in time to the Philadelphia era of the church and read Revelations 3, verse 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. There are two points I would like to look at in verse 10. First, Jesus says he will keep the Philadelphian church from the hour of trial that comes upon the whole world. That hour of trial is the Great Tribulation that starts three and a half years before Jesus returns. In order for Jesus to keep the Philadelphian Christians from that hour of trial, Philadelphian Christians must be present when he returns. The second point that we are going to look at more closely as we proceed is the fact that if the Philadelphia church is going to be protected from the persecution that occurs during the Great Tribulation, it must wind up being, the Philadelphian church must wind up being persecuted prior to the Great Tribulation. Now it's true that uh, persecution will come on all of us individually and has historically come on all those that are faithful to Jesus uh, and to the Word of God. However, during these end times, the persecutions will be primarily directed toward the Philadelphian uh, Christians prior to the start of the Great Tribulation and directed toward the remaining non-Philadelphian Christians during the Great Tribulation. Now let's read about the seventh and last era of the churches of God, the current era of the Laodicean churches. Because of the fact that the era of the Laodicean churches is the last era, and the fact that portions of the previous three eras of the church are present when Jesus returns, it is obvious that the Laodicean era, being last, would also be present when he returns. Therefore, I want to look at the portion of the admonition given to the Laodicean churches found in Revelations 3 verses 18 and 19. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed with, uh, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. In verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Notice in verse 18, Jesus counsels the Laodiceans to buy from him gold refined in the fire. Gold refined in fire reflects persecutions. God wants to refine those he loves to become pure gold. In verse 19, as we previously read in the book of Hebrews, 
we are reminded that Jesus baptizes and rebukes those he loves. It is interesting to read about uh, all the seven church eras in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation and realize that each era received a different reward based on their works. We are not claiming the concept of salvation by works. However, we are claiming that the Bible very clearly and emphatically tells us we will most definitely be rewarded according to our works. Continuing in our discussion of Christian persecution, now we understand that Christians are persecuted because of the love of God and his desire to perfect us in, uh, with his holy character so we can become his children. He wants to refine us and remove all our dross until we are 100% pure gold. God's goal of accomplishing in us a character uh, that is symbolized by 100% fine gold will be completed in the first resurrection when he has perfected in us his holy character. We will notice in the description of the characteristics of the last four churches, church eras that are present when Jesus returns that three church eras are persecuted during the Great Tribulation and one is persecuted prior to the Great Tribulation. The church era that is persecuted prior to the hour of trial that comes on the whole earth is the Philadelphian era. Of those four church eras, it is only the Philadelphia era that is said to have not denied the name of Jesus and kept his word. Each of us can individually decide for ourselves which church we presently belong to and which church era we want to belong to. Have we denied the name of Jesus? Have we kept his word? Or not? Now that we know there must be persecutions during the age, uh, during this age, because God loves us and needs uh, to chasten us so that we can be put on His holy, uh, His holiness. The question that remains is why must there be persecutions in the first place, and why must there be a great tribulation? Couldn't God find some other way to show us He loves us? Well, there must be persecutions during this age for at least two reasons. Both of those reasons start in Genesis and are somewhat related to the seventh day Sabbath. For a brief overview, let's start in Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Verse 2 informs us that God ended his work of creating on the seventh day, or at the end of the sixth day. This is important to remember. Now I want to add these verses to what we just read, 2 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. From these two sets of verses in Genesis and Peter, we realize that, in human terms, God's seven-day week is 7,000 years long, with the last thousand years, or seventh day, being the Sabbath day of entering God's rest. Let's go back to Genesis and go to chapter 3. This is where Satan deceived Eve. Adam rejected God and sin, and God pronounced sentences and prophecies on Adam, Eve, and Satan. Since Adam, and all humanity for that matter, had rejected God's word and did what seemed right in their own eyes, God prohibited humanity from partaking of the tree of life. However, God granted humanity six days in which to work to bring about their own utopian government to replace his government. And because of that, and the prophecy pronounced against Satan, Satan also knew he only had six 1,000-year days in which to bring about the annihilation of humanity and the destruction of the promised seed. <clears throat> so 
So, up to this point, the scriptures tell us there will be persecution of the Christians that are members of the church Jesus built. We know that God will allow those persecutions because uh, He loves us and wants to refine us to pure gold. Which pure gold is the symbolism for the character of God. We also know that the members of God's church are members of one of the four remaining eras of the church described in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. In addition, we know that since the Philadelphian era of the church will be protected from uh, persecution during the Great Trib Tribulation, the Philadelphian church era will be persecuted prior to the Great Tribulation. And since our focus today is in time persecution and the love of God, the Philadelphian era of the church will be persecuted during the first three and a half years of the seven year period prior to Jesus' return, and the remaining portion of the other three eras of the church will be persecuted primarily during the last three and a half years of that seven year period. Let's first take a look at the uh, persecution in the book of Daniel. In these verses, uh, Daniel is relating to us his understanding of the revealed knowledge of God. Let's start with the persecution of the Philadelphian portion of the church of God in Daniel 11, 29 uh, through th verse 35. 29. At the appointed time he shall return and go toward the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. At this time, the prince who is uh, to come in Daniel 9.26, uh, which may have already become the king of the north, is heading south toward Jerusalem with the intent of military action. Now continuing in verse 30. For ships from uh, Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the holy covenant and do damage. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Verse 30 tells us that ships from Cyprus will come against the king of the north, which further supports that the king of uh, the north's intentions for going toward the south in verse 29 was for the purpose of military conquest. Ships from Cyprus and this is the reference from ships from western lands, which would mean ships from the United States, uh, United States which may also include ships from Great Britain. But notice what happens next. The king of the north is enraged against the Holy Covenant, which is to say the king of the north is enraged against those that keep the commandments of God and have not denied his name, which is also to say that the king of the north is enraged against the Philadelphian portion of the Church of God. This may very well be because the Philadelphian portion of the Church of God understands the prophecies that are being fulfilled and are proclaiming the fulfillment of those prophecies to the world. Notice the end of verse 30 shows the king of uh, the north will show favor to those that abandon the Philadelphian remnant uh, and or betray the continuing church of God. Now verse 31. And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortresses. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices, and place there the abomination of desolation. We see in verse 31 that the king of the north will take away the daily sacrifices. Now verse 32. Those who do wickedly against uh, the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. In verse 32, we once again see that the king of the north will try to corrupt the continuing church of God. But look at the last half of verse 32. Many of the Philadelphians will be strong and carry out something. Great exploits is in italics, meaning that was added in, uh, by the translators and not in the original text. So people being strong and doing something is referring to many people that are listening and responding to this message right now. This verse is referring to those that uh, run the race to the end and accept the chastisement of the Father that he uses to refuse uh, to refine them into pure gold. People that he is right now preparing to become the bride of his son at the first resurrection. Now verse 33. 
and those of the people who understand shall instruct many. Yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. This verse applies to the entire seven year period uh, prior to the return of Christ. We see that Philadelphian Christians will instruct many, which is partially because of Philadelphian remnant sermons and literature. Then we see that for many da for days, many is, is not in the original text. We see that for days we shall fall by sword, by captivity, and plundering. There's a little relief spoken of in verse 34. Verse 34. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue. When we fall, we are told we will be given a little help. We don't know where this help will come from, the Holy Spirit, the Archangel Michael, or some human source. We just know we will be helped. We just have to be strong and run the race to the end. Verse 35, we are reminded why this persecution must come. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Once again, these verses apply to the remnant of the four church eras. Notice, God allows this persecution to come in order to refine and purify in us into 100% pure gold. Philadelphia persecution is uh, also listed in Daniel 7.25, which specifically shows a two-part persecution coming. I will break this two-part persecution in Daniel 7.25 into part A and part B. So here's part A. Daniel 7.25a He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Now part B. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. First of all, A, he shall persecute certain of the saints, which is consistent with what Jesus said uh, was coming in Matthew 24, verses 19-14, which I'm going to read right now. Matthew uh, 24, 9 through 14. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise, will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Much of the above will affect the Philadelphian Christians, uh, but they will later be protected in the wilderness for a time, times, and half a time. Some of the remnant of the Thyatira era may also be protected along with the Philadelphian Christ, uh, saints. Also notice Satan is not particular about killing it is likely that some of the non-Philadelphian Christians will be persecuted and be killed as well. Now, I'm going to go uh, in Daniel 7, uh, in 25a, persecutions which are uh, consistent with the persecutions in Daniel 11, 28 through 35, are a factor in the opening of the fifth seal in Revelation, which is the start of the Great Tribulation. But what about the other non-Philadelphian Christians? So now we read uh, Revelation 6, 9-11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Uh, then with a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while, longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Notice that this is consistent with Daniel 7.25 A and B. There were those who were martyred or persecuted, which is 7.25 A. Then there were to be more who were 
uh, martyred and persecuted, 725b. In Daniel 7.25b, the remaining saints will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. This is the persecution of the portion of the non-Philadelphian Church of God, uh, including non-protected Thyatinians, who were not protected in the wilderness with the Philadelphians. Revelations 12.17 shows this separation. Here is Revelations 12.17. Notice. And the dragon, which was uh, enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There are persecutions just before the Great Tribulation starts per Daniel 7.25a. And then during the time of the Great Tribulation as per, per Daniel 7.25b. Now let's go to Daniel uh, 11.36 through 30, 11, Daniel 11.38. Verse 36, Then the king shall do according to his own, his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wraths have been accomplished, for what, for what has been determined shall be done. He shall regard neither the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a god of fortresses, and a God which his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Here we see the king of the north exalting himself above every God and speaking blasphemies against the true God. The start of the great tribulation begins in verse 39. Then he shall act against the strongest fortresses, with a foreign God which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and divide the land for gain. In verse 39, we see the king of the north attacks the United States of America. The end of verse 39 shows us that the king of the north defeated the country with the strongest fortresses, because he divided some of the land with his accomplices, and increased his wealth with other parts of the land by divi uh, dividing it for gain. Let's see how bad the Great Tribulation will get and see the influence of Satan at the end of the six-day work week God granted Adam to bring about humanity's version of utopia. We'll start with Matthew 24, verse 15, and read through 22. Uh, verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of uh, desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let, whom, who, let him who is on the housetops not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. <clears throat> but woe to those who are pregnant uh, and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as it not been since the beginning of the world. Until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. We see in verse 15 that this time frame is indeed referring to the abominations that Daniel wrote about. Uh, that Daniel wrote about. Now, when we drop down to verse 22, we see that if left unchecked, Humanity's attempt at utopian would be, uh, I'm going to start that over. Uh, now when we drop down to verse 22, we see that if left unchecked, humanity's attempt at utopia by doing what seems right in their own eyes uh, would have resulted in the extermination of the entire human race. Again, the reason I wanted to focus on the chastisement in Daniel and Revelation is because that is the time frame we are entering in now. We, and all the churches of God, are going to be facing the persecutions and chastisement God has appointed for us to refine us and help us prepare to become the bride of Christ. Whether we are chastised before the Great Tribulation starts <clears throat> as Philadelphians, or chastised after it starts as a member of one of the other portions of the Church of God, rest assured, Persecution is prophesied, and persecution is coming.
<clears throat> it's my desire to help us get ready both spiritually and mentally for this coming chastisement. I will try to help us get ready spiritually by presenting scriptures that God provided for, uh, to us for this pr very purpose. I'll present these uh, verses at the end of this discussion. But first, I want to bring us, uh, help us get ready mentally by preparing some verses, uh, pre presenting some verses that God provided for this purpose by going to the book of Job. We in the Church of God have long realized that persecutions and chastisements are coming and uh, we also realize they are part of being a Christian. However, many of our thoughts of chastisement are rather vague, with no clear picture of the type or severity of the chastisement that is coming. We read earlier that we will be sub subject to plundering, but even that is, that is either rather vague. Will we be plundered of our car, our home, our bank account? To help put a clearer uh, picture on the type of chastisement that God may use to refine us into pure gold, let's take a look at the example of Job. We'll start with verse 1 in Job, chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Notice, Job is already described as blameless, upright, God-fearing, and shunning evil. It sounds like Job was already pretty close to 100% pure gold, as far as a human eye could tell. Yet, as God is perfect, he also wants his children to be perfect, and therefore, he wanted to refine that last little bit of dross out of Job to prepare him for the uh, resurrection and being part of the Bride of Christ. Remember, as we go through the chastisement of Job, we want to put ourselves in the position of Job. We need to think that we are Job. Wherever we use the name Job, replace it with your own name. Realize that this is the chastisement that God may decide is best in order to refine us into pure gold also. Now let's take a look at uh, Job chapter 1 verses 6 and 7. Chapter 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, from walking back and forth on it. The entire book of Job, remember to <coughs> replace your own name for the name of Job. So the entire book of Job was initiated and controlled by God. Satan had nothing to do with it, other than what God allowed him to do. Even though he may have thought he did. So, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord in verse 6, it was not at their command, it was at the command of God. It is not the troops that call for a review, it is the commander-in-chief that calls for a review. This is why we see, we see Satan was also among those that came to present himself before the Lord. Satan was ordered to come by the command of God for the very purpose of removing the last little bit of dross from you. In the beginning of verse 7, God sets Satan up for the next stage of his plan and starts out developing a conversation with Satan by asking the question, From where do you come? Satan responds in the last verse of 7, From going to and fro, on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Satan would have been more truthful had he said from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it, seeking whom I may destroy. But that wasn't part of the answer. So in verse 8, God springs the trap on Satan and asks Satan. Verse 8, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man? one who fears God and shuns evil. God knows that Satan, the accuser of the brethren, is not about to stand idly by and not take this perfect opportunity to accuse Job or you. We find Satan's reply and accusation in verses uh, 9 through 11. Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? 
have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed his work, the work of his hands, uh, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, <clears throat> but now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The trap has been sprung. God has now created the perfect circumstance in which he can begin to, your, ch your chastisement, in this case Job's, but yours, and start the process of removing that last little bit of dross and refining you into pure gold. God's response to uh, Satan in, is in verse, uh, Job verse 12, chapter 1 verse 12. And the Lord say, said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay your hand on his person. God now turns you over to Satan to do with you what he will. Only Satan is not allowed to harm you personally. So Satan starts to go uh, to work on Job. Verses 13 through 15. Now there was a day when the sons of, and daughters were, uh, when his sons, Job's sons, and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their uh, oldest brother's house. And a messenger uh, came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and donkeys feeding beside them, uh, when the Sabaeans uh, raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. The plundering begins with losing your job, your sources of income. Uh, in Job's case, this might be represented by plowing oxen. Satan continues in uh, verse 16. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and uh, burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Your chastisement from God continues. Now your food is taken, in this case represented by the sheep. God is not done yet. There's more chastisement in verse 17. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The uh, Chaldeans form, uh, formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Now your bank account has been seized, and you no, no longer have access to your CBDCs, or credit cards. This is represented by Job's camels. In quick succession, Job's chastise, God's chastisement brings the loss of your job, the loss of your food, and the loss of your, and your bank account has been frozen. The level of this personal chastisement may be uh, more than we had previously considered when we reflected on the coming persecution of Christians. Again, in order to really understand the level of uh, love God had, has for Job and you, and me, we must put ourselves in Job's position. We must remember that God loves those he chastises. If you're never chastised, you're illegitimate. This is perhaps more important now than at any time during our past Christian walk because we know the season is near. Nevertheless, God is not done with your chastisement. He let Satan continue. Before we read about that continuance, I want us to take a minute and think about our children. Think about their names. Think about the day they were born. How old are they? How many boys do you have? How many girls? Do you have no children? Think about your loved ones. Think about your brothers and sisters. Do you have a favorite aunt? What's your name? Take a minute to put those thoughts in your love, uh, of your loved ones in your mind. Now we'll continue. Job 1 verses 18 and 19. While he was still speaking, another came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young couple, on the young people. And they all are all dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. This is serious chastisement. God also loves us so much that this level of chastisement that was given to Job may very well come on some of us also. Before we continue with our discussion, I want to remind us uh, of 1 Corinthians 10.13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. 
but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. The word temptation here means adversity or trial. No adversity or trial, no chastisement, will come to us that is beyond our ability to bear. Remember too that Job understood the resurrection, just as we do. And it's possible that with the loss of his children, he took some measure of comfort in the fact, just as we would. Let's look at that in Job uh, 19, verses 25 and 27. Job 25. For I know that my Redeemer, this is Job speaking, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me, Job's heart and ours, yearns within us for the kingdom of God. Now let's see how Job handled this chastisement from God in verses uh, 20 through 22, chapter 1, uh, verse 20. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell uh, to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not... Uh, sin, nor charge God with, with wrong. In verse 20, we see that Job was grieved and tore his robe, but we also see that he fell to the ground and worshipped. In verse 21, Job pronounces a blessing on the name of the Lord. This is our example from God on how to respond during our chastisement. It's okay to mourn, but we must continue to pray and worship God and bless His name however severe the chastisement may be at the time. Remember that we learned what we learned earlier in Hebrews 12.21. Now, no chastening uh, seems to be joyful for the moment, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Our chastisement now and in the future, just like Job's, is for our training in righteousness. So now Job has not only lost his job, his food, and all his cash and CBDCs, has been, uh, and all his cash has been frozen, but a house fell on all his children and they are dead. Yet through all this, neither you nor Job sinned. But God loved us so much that he knew we could develop even more righteous character, and so he called another review of the angels. This review is very similar to the one we read about in chapter 1. This review uh, starts in Job 2, chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to pre present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Once again, God called for a review of the angels, and Satan was summoned also. Once again, God asked Satan where he came from. In verse 3, God once again sets the trap for Satan. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. God confirms that Job is blameless and upright and fears God and shuns evil. Of course, this is just what Satan again wants to hear, so he once again can accuse the brethren. We see this in Job 2 verse 4. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan is sure he has God backed into a corner. But this is exactly what God wants. In order to give Job, slash us, 
the ultimate chastisement. God could uh, have ultimately chastised us, uh, could have already chastised us with the loss of our wealth and much of that we love, and he may also chastise us with our uh, flesh, our health. We can read about how Satan uh, was set up to allow God's final chastisement of Job in verse 6. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. The only thing God withheld from Satan was Job's life. For some of us, in the very near future, God's final chastisement may very well include our life. I know this is a rather bleak uh, discussion, but Job, uh, but Job wasn't the last person to lose everything because uh, God was developing righteous character through chastisement. Nevertheless, as we previously read in Daniel, uh, Daniel, additional chastisement and persecution is going to come to those God loves. It's better that we understand now that summer is nigh and that the end of mankind's allotted six days of work in which to bring about their version of utopia as well as the end of Satan's six days of work in which to attempt uh, to usurp God's authority is coming to a close. We'll read what Satan does next in verses Job, chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. Chapter 7. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his uh, foot to the crown of his head. So God's final chastisement was allowing Job to be afflicted with painful boils from head to toe. Uh, head to toe. Verse 8. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. In my opinion, Job's pain was so great that he was scraping his flesh off just for some re relief. That's extreme pain. Now notice verse 9. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Remember, Job's wife also suffered the loss of all their wealth, as well as the pain of losing her children. Yet, she also recognized Job's integrity. She told Job to just get it over with and curse God and die. Verse 10 is Job's response. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. The suggestion of Job's wife is deemed as foolish. This is something we must remember. Job goes on to point out that we must accept adversity or evil. As the old King James puts it, from God as well as good. There are two points that are interesting in that statement. One point is that Job pointed out that the adversity we receive is from God as well as the good. The second point is that we must accept the adversity. The adversity is the chastisement that God gives to his, the children he loves so that they can develop holy, righteous character for our work in the first resurrection. And then in Job's last statement in verse 10, we learn that in all Job's adversity, he did not sin with his lips. This brings uh, about an end to God's use of Satan to bring about the chastisement of Job that would lead to the removal of the last little bit of dross in Job's character and, the end, and end with Job's refinement into pure gold. An additional portion uh, of Job's refinement comes from God's use of the admonition of three of Job's uh, misguided friends starting with the last uh, verse in chapter 2 and running through chapter 37. And this purification that comes uh, from a personal encounter with God himself, starting in chapter 38 and going through chapter 41, which I would leave for you to read on your own. <clears throat> I want to pick up uh, reading about Job's physical reward and for remaining steadfast during his chastisement. We can find this in Job uh, 42, verses 12 through 17. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. 
He also had seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Jemima, the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Habak. In all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died in old so Job died old and full of days. We see in verse 12 that Job's wealth was restored double. In verse 13, the number of his children were restored. And in verse 16, we see that Job lived an additional 140 years after his chastisement from God began. The earthly reward of Job is very similar to the parable of the minus in Luke 11, 19-23. We also know that the spiritual reward of Job will be greater than the physical reward. And we read in uh, Hebrews uh, 11, chapter 11, that the reward of the faithful, which Job was, will be to enter God's rest at the resurrection of the dead at Jesus' return. We just read about the physical chastisement of Job that God allowed to befall Job in order to begin the process of removing the last uh, little bit of dross from his character. We also read in the book of Daniel that the time is at hand for many of us to face the possibility of similar chastisement. Are you still thinking of your children and loved ones in relation to the physical chastisement of Job? We need to remember the physical chastisement is not the only type of chastisement that God allows Satan to perpetrate on us. There's also a mental chastisement. Now is the time to shift our thinking to a different type of mental chastisement God allows us, uh, allows to befall us as he removes the draws from our character. The mental chastisement of doubt, worry, fear is just as great as the physical chastisement of losing our loved ones and losing our physical possessions. Our mental persecution serves the same purpose as our physical chastisement. Our mental persecution or chastisement is also from God and is used by Him to chastise us as His beloved children. So now let's look at some chast verses talking about mental chastisement. The first one we'll look at is in Matthew 14, verses 28 through 32. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come uh, down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning uh, to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Here we find two mental chastisements and one admonition. The two chastisements are fear, found in verse 30, and doubt, found in verse 31. Fear and doubt seem to be tied together. If we fear, then we also seem to doubt. And if we doubt, we are most definitely afraid. The admonition is also found in verse 31 and is stated, O you of little faith. The remedy for the chastisement of fear and doubt is faith. Next, let's look at Matthew 21, verses uh, 20 22. And when the disciples saw, saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. In these verses we have one chastisement and one admonition. The chastisement is found in verse 21 and is, once again, fear. The ad admonition is also found in verse 21 and is, once again, lack of faith. And once again, we see the draws God wants to remove from us uh, that are being mentally chastised 
our doubt and fear. God is showing us that it is a lack of faith that the accuser of the brethren was allowed to perpetrate on us that has allowed the draws of fear and doubt to form. Let's look at one more scripture relating to fear, which is also associated with doubt. This is in 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 and 7. Verse 6. Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now here we see in verse 7 that God has not given us a spirit of fear. We also see that God gave us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Therefore, the spirit of fear had to come from somewhere else. God allowed the spirit, of, uh, spirit to come from the accuser of the brethren in order to remove our draws. Verse 6 is interesting. Paul is reminding Timothy to stir up the gift of God that he re had received through the laying on of Paul's hands. That gift of God that Timothy received is the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have also received that gift. Paul is telling us to stir up the Holy Spirit in order to cast out the draws of the spirit of fear. Let's remember the fear that, the fear that filled Peter when God struck uh, the shepherd and he denied he even knew Jesus. Then remember the power Peter had when he received the Holy Spirit. We have that power now. Those verses pointed out some mental chastisement some of us may be suffering, as well as some ways to remove the draws of fear and doubt. And the book of Job pointed out some physical chastisements that some of us may be suffering. However, there will be more mental and physical chastisements coming to Christians in the near future, and they will be severe starting with the Philadelphian portion of the Church of God, and later to the remaining Christians. So what are some other scriptures we can uh, look at that will help us run the race to the end and remove the last remaining impurities that would allow us to stand before the Son of Man? Let's start with Luke, chapter 21, verses 34 and 36. Verse 34. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the uh, whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always, that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. These verses are speaking of the time directly ahead of us. In verse 34, we are told to take heed to ourselves and don't let our hearts be weighed down with the cares of this life. A really important tip is found in verse 36. Pray always. We are to pray always that we would be counted worthy to escape the draws of this life and to stand before the Son of Man. We won't escape the, chast the chastisement but we want to escape the snare or the trap for us that has been laid by Satan. Now let's look at uh, Philippians 4, verses 10 through 13. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did uh, care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard uh, to me, for I have learned in whatever state I am, to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Here we are told that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Remember, God's goal is to remove our draws. So we can stand, so we can become worthy to stand before the Son of Man. 
So when we pray, ask God to show us the dross that we need to remove uh, to be refined. Then turn yourself over to Christ to strengthen you. Let's look at some verses that add to the verse we just read. They're found in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 through 11. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who call us uh, to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and forever. Amen. Here we are reminded that the adversary <clears throat> that God used to refine Job is also the adversary he will use to refine us. We are commanded to resist him, knowing that the same thing is happening to each and every one of us. What's happening to you is also happening to me. And to others in the church. The same thing is happening to all of us. But when we read the last part of verse 10, after God has removed the draws from all of us, He will perfect, strengthen, and settle us. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Let's look at a couple of scriptures that we can do personally. The first one is in John 15, 1-4. Verse 1. I am the true vine, of course is Jesus speaking, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch, branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, and the branch, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. We are to abide in Christ and bear fruit. There are many scriptures that describe what we can do to bear fruit. I will sum up those scriptures and let each of you, us do a personal study to get more detail on bearing fruit. Summing up the scriptures on bearing fruit can be done in one word. Love. We'll read the verses on perfect love. It's found in 1 John 4, 17-19. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may uh, have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. A perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he loved us. Brethren, there is no love, fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. One more verse I want to look at that will give us direction on what we can do to remove the draws from our character is James 5.16. Confess your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Let's pray for one another, brethren. We know that summer is near. The great tribulation is just ahead of us. When we know that a seven-week covenant is confirmed by a high-level European, we will know that the return of the Messiah will come approximately seven years later. Philadelphian Christians will be the target of the initial pre-tribulation persecutions. Other Christians, some of whom may try to distance themselves from us, will not escape the persecutions that will hit when the Great Tribulation begins. So in conclusion, 
There was a song by Tom Petty with two lyric, sets of lyrics I want to refer to. The first set is, I won't back down. And the second is, I'll stand my ground. I think those two sets of verse, lyrics can be used as a type of reinforcement of our thinking at this time. In the soon coming persecution, when we are told we can keep our house, we can keep our car, we can keep our bank account, if we will only denounce the Seventh-day Sabbath by the, strength, by the strength of Jesus Christ, we will say, no, and I won't back down. And in the soon coming persecution, when we are told our lives and the lives of our loved ones will be spared, if we will only bow down and worship the beast, by the strength of Jesus Christ, we will say, no, I'll stand my ground. We are not going to go through the tribulation alone, brethren. We are going to go through the tribulation with Jesus Christ. And we are going to go through it together. This is Steve Dupuy for the Continuing Church of God.